This is Ned Brooks inviting you to meet the press. Our guest today is Senator John Kennedy, the Democratic nominee for president. As the tempo of the campaign increases, both candidates are predicting a close election. Asking the questions today on Meet the Press are Edward Folliard of the Washington Post, Ellie Abel of the Detroit News, John Chancellor of NBC News, and Lawrence E. Spivak, our regular member of the Meet the Press panel. Meet the Press, America's press conference of the air, and winner of every major award in its field, will continue after the following message. The presidential campaign is entering its final three weeks with the issue of foreign policy commanding much attention from both candidates. Senator Kennedy, who is our guest today, will begin this week's activities with a tour of southern and central Ohio. It will be his seventh visit to that pivotal state. Climaxing the week's campaign will be the fourth debate on Friday between Senator Kennedy and Vice President Nixon. We'll start the questions today with Mr. Spivak. Well, Senator Kennedy, there's been a lot of heat generated on the issue of Kamoy and Matsu. And now, judging by the newspapers, you and Mr. Nixon and President Eisenhower seem to be in agreement. I'd like to ask you whether you think you are in agreement on the issue or whether there is still a difference be among you. Well, I've always been in agreement with the President's uh, policy towards uh, our treaty commitments and towards Kimoy and Matsu, as defined in public statements of the administration since 1955, and also as defined by administration spokesmen in executive session of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I've never disagreed with that position. My judgment was, and I think it was very clear, that a week ago, during our second debate, and in his speech in Albuquerque uh, following that second debate, Mr. Nixon did seem to disagree with the administration. As I gathered his statements at that time, he wanted to extend our commitment our treaty commitment, which now binds us to the defense of Formosa and the Pescadores, to cover the islands of Quimoy and Matsu. Now, yesterday, Mr. Nixon announced that he agreed with the president and the administration. On, I agree with the president and the administration. So that I think, uh, it's my hope that, uh, as I would not want any issue to endanger the security of the United States, I would certainly feel that in the tradition of bipartisanship, no area in the field of foreign policy should be used for political advantage. If we both agree with the president, in my opinion, the, the matter is then closed. Well, now, Senator, the New York Times in its analysis today says that the essential difference remained that Mr. Nixon would hold the islands and Mr. Kennedy would attempt to disengage the U.S. from them. Well, now, that, is, that is a fair my, No, but uh, what is the administration position? The administration position since 1955 has been that we would defend Formosa and the Pescadores, that we would defend Kimoy and Matsu, if there were an attack which was part of an attack on Formosa and the Pescadores. If, there were, if the attack was not part of an overall attack on Formosa and the Pescadores, then our treaty commitment would not bind. That's the official statement of our position since 1955. Now, in the spring of 1955, the President said Walter Robertson, who was Assistant Secretary of State for Far Eastern Affairs, and Admiral Radford to uh, see Chiang Kai-shek in an attempt to persuade him to withdraw the nationalist troops from Kimoy and Matsu. Chiang Kai-shek refused to do so. Again, off and on since 1955, we've attempted to persuade Chiang Kai-shek to lessen his troop involvement there. In fact, uh, at the time when our conversations were taking place at Geneva and at Warsaw with the Chinese communists, we discussed the problem, the possibility of the United Nations coming into these islands, of a de facto ceasefire coming into those islands. So if I may say that in my judgment, the position of the administration has been that we should defend these islands if it's part of an attack. Meanwhile, they have attempted to persuade Chiang Kai-shek to reduce his commitment. Chiang Kai-shek has been unwilling to do so. And because we didn't want to break morale on Formosa, and because we've been unable to persuade him to withdraw, the situation has remained in flux and rather uncertain. But I agree with the position that the, we should meet our commitments there, we should meet our commitments to uh, uh, Formosa and the Pescadores, and we should attempt to continue the negotiations which are now going on to persuade, if possible, the United Nations to come in there, a ceasefire in the area, or whatever it may be. So that uh, the reason that there may be some uh, ambiguity, Mr. Spivak, in the matter is there's some ambiguity in the treaty and in our statements. But I don't uh, want the Chinese Communists to be under any misapprehension. I support present administration policy. I support the administration policy 
towards Kimo and Matsu over the last five years. It is the same position that I take. The point is that Mr. Nixon wanted to extend our commitment to guarantee those islands, regardless of whether or not the attack was part of an overall attack on Formosa and the Pesca. Well, now, the Generalissimo has said that it is a matter of morale, and he says that if we lost those offshore islands, even the U.S. 7th Fleet couldn't defend Formosa. That's the reason that we've been unable to persuade him to withdraw from these islands. But, Mr. Spivak, in the last 24 hours, I have read administration statements from the highest source before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as late as 1959. And these statements, and the statements in 58, uh, during the time of the bombardment, indicate very clearly, as does the uh, mission of Walter Robertson and Admiral Radford, was the attempt to persuade Chiang Kai-shek to lessen his commitment on these islands. Well, Senator, the President of the United States in his press conference in 58 said it was unwise to move so many troops to these islands. As one of these islands is two miles from the coast of China. Well, Senator, it's a practical thing, though. If the islands are attacked and uh, the Generalissimo fights for them, as though they were part of the Formosa business, because it's going to hurt morale if he loses them, just how will the United States at any time be able to disengage them, itself from the whole business? That is why, the whole Spivak, business? The, for five years, this matter has been involved in this very difficult way. There has been no doubt that administration policy since 1955 has been to persuade Chiang Kai-shek to lessen the number of his troops on these islands. He has been unwilling to do so. And that is why we are still involved in the subject of, of Kimoy and Matsu. Not because these islands are strategically defensible. Not because uh, they're easy to hold. But because Chiang Kai-shek has been unwilling to withdraw and we've been unable to persuade him to do so. But I want to make it clear, Mr. Spivak, that the administration has never suggested that we should extend our treaty commitment to these islands. Mr. Nixon, in his speech in Albuquerque, said we shouldn't yield one inch there. And yet for five years, we have on and off attempted to persuade Chiang Kai-shek to lessen his troop commitment. We've talked about the United Nations coming in. We even discussed the matter with the Chinese communists. There's no doubt of this record, nor would the Secretary of State or the President say that it wasn't so, because it is so. Now, I, don't, I feel that if Mr. Nixon supports administration policy in this area, I do too. Therefore, I'm prepared to move on to a discussion of other issues. This issue, in my opinion, could properly be closed. I would not want the Chinese communists to think we're divided over our support of our treaty commitments and their implications in this area. And as an American, I am prepared. I, def I voted for the treaty in 55. I'm prepared to meet that commitment. But I don't want anybody to be under any illusions that it is a situation which is not wholly satisfactory from our point of view. Admiral Yarnell said these islands weren't the worth the bones of a single American soldier. And therefore, if Mr. Nixon has now retreated to the support of the administration position, in my judgment then, that could close properly the matter unless he wishes to continue it. Mr. Chancellor. Uh, Senator, do you think you'll have any more success with Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek or with the Chinese and the administration Nobody has had? Nobody can tell what the future will be. It is a difficult problem. We are not happy about the situation in Kimoy and Matsu. As I say, one of these islands is only two miles from the coast, uh, nearest coast of, uh, of China. Therefore, they can be bombarded as they are by artillery daily to hold them that require nuclear weapons. There is, to the Pescadores, a whole reach of open sea, 75 miles, to Formosa more than 100 miles. So that it is a difficult problem. But if he will not leave, we don't want to see an attack take place under the uh, impression that the Chinese Communists might have that we won't support Chiang Kai-shek. So that's why this situation still hangs after five years. And I would think it would be a difficult matter for the next president. And I don't want to say anything in this campaign that will make either Mr. Nixon's responsibility or mine more difficult in January. Well, Senator, in that context, you said yesterday, let the debate return now to the real issues of the campaign. <clears throat> Yet today you continue to discuss Mr. Nixon's attitude on the... Because last night I said I was prepared to close the... in my official statement. Then last night after he said that uh, he supported the president, in his speech given last night, in his release, he attacked me for uh, my position on these islands and said that uh, I was uh, uh, working against the interests of the country and all kinds of statements. I don't know what the issue now is, providing he supports the president's position. So do I. But I think that's an entirely different position than he took a week ago. Now, in my opinion, if we are both in support of the president, and there are great issues which disturb our country, it would seem to me that I would be prepared to move on to the discussion of those issues. I saw in the morning paper, the New York Daily News, that Mr. Nixon proposes to discuss these two islands for the next three weeks. What are we discussing now? As long as he support the president, and I do, I think that we, in the interests of bipartisanship, I would not endanger the situation in that area by attempting to drag it into a political campaign. 
That's my view, and I'm prepared to rest on it and make this the last word. Well, Senator, if we could move on then to another issue. It seems that every year in the United Nations we get closer to the admission of Red China. Now, have you given much thought to what your reaction as president would be if during your administration China, Red China, won a seat in the United Nations? Well, I would be opposed to the admission of Red China if, as long as Red China's official foreign policy is the belief in the inevitability and the desirability of war. The whole dialectic that they're now engaged in with the Russians is on this question of the desirability of war as a method of, of communizing the world. Now, it's rather difficult to vote to admit Red China when her foreign policy officially is based on that uh, complete hostility to the United Nations. That is the, uh, that is the issue. Now, if, it's, if they with, withdraw on that, other communist countries are in, and therefore, uh, of course, our position might change. But uh, it's rather difficult to consider changing that position. Now, they may be voted in, but not uh, with our agreement if that is their official announced policy and, in fact, is the cause of a major dispute with the Soviet Union between the Chinese and the Russians on that issue. Mr. Abel. Senator, uh, I'd like to bring you back home for a minute, if I may. Uh, some of your supporters in the labor movement are distributing a four-page broadsheet, which uh, seems to suggest that a vote against you is a vote for bigotry. I have in mind a, a reprint from the United Auto Workers paper, Solidarity, which has been widely distributed in Michigan and some other industrial states. Uh, the, the key theme seems to be which do you choose, liberty or bigotry? A vote for Kennedy being a vote for liberty, presumably. Do you think this is a proper appeal for your supporters to well, be Well, I making? haven't seen it, so I, I'd be reluctant to characterize it. I've attempted in all my statements, and I don't think there's any doubt of that, that I've attempted to uh, try to uh, keep uh, the, so, the religious issue uh, from becoming a matter of dispute between the parties or between the candidates. Uh, that is my view. I think that uh, the candidates and the two political parties are devoted to the Constitution. And uh, therefore, in my judgment, uh, with all these other matters disturbing us, uh, this should not be an issue on one side or the other. Uh, re returning for a moment to the general uh, argument made here, which we've seen in other states as well, which you might call a form of bigotry in reverse, uh, do you repudiate that, 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 that kind of appeal to the voters? Yes, I haven't seen the uh, article, but let me just say that I have said in my acceptance speech, as I had said on many occasions before, that I hope no one would vote for me, either for me or because of my religion. Now, I've said that consistently, and I, I mean it, because it's, it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's an important election. There are very serious issues which divide us, and I don't think this is one of them. My religion, or Mr. Nixon's religion, or... After all, I thought that matter was all settled in the Constitution when it said, provided for separation of church and state, when it provided that there should be no religious test for office. So I would hope we could move on. They did it much better than we can do. With, in, we can't improve on the Constitution, so I think we should sustain it. Mr. Fowler. Senator, you have been criticizing uh, the inflation in the Eisenhower years, the shrinkage of the dollar. What would you do to halt inflation uh, to give us a stable dollar. Well, I don't feel, uh, uh, Mr. Boyd, that uh, we have been able to maintain uh, such a uh, uh, limit on the, dif on, the, uh, on the increase in the cost of living, which would warrant the administration pursuing with such vigor the uh, high money, uh, tight uh, interest rate policy, high interest rate policy. I think that that has been deflationary on the one hand, which has helped cause the recession of 54, intensify the recession of 58, contribute to the slowdown of 1960. And on the other, it has not held down the cost of living very satisfactorily. I would therefore feel that a greater stimulation to our economy to provide uh, fuller use of our facilities, fuller use of our manpower, and uh, I would hope a competition, vigorous uh, use of the antitrust laws and all the rest would provide sufficient price competition to maintain a reasonable stability in the dollar. You may get some inflation because historically our inf we've gradually had inflation. The problem is to keep it in uh, balance uh, with our increase in our productive capacity and increase in our gross national product. Yeah. Uh, the other day up in New York, you said that one of the great political myths of our time is the notion that uh, there's a conflict between the Democratic Party and the business community. That's that's right. Well, businessmen don't seem to think that's a myth. That's right. At least as I understand it, most of them are Republicans. That's right. If elected president, what would you do to reassure the business community? Well, let me just say that if the president of the United States 
His basic uh, domestic objective will be to maintain full employment in the country for two reasons. First, because he wants people to have jobs, and secondly, because it's only if our economy is booming that we can get the revenues to provide for our defense and all the rest of the program. So he has to provide, try to provide, and his party, an atmosphere by which business will flourish. They are the employers. So that, uh, in my opinion, they may disagree, businessmen, with uh, the policies of our party, but the policies of our party are directed to encouraging full employment in the United States. We could not possibly sustain ourselves as a country. We could not possibly be successful as a party. We could not implement our programs. If we had the business was bad and people were being laid off and you had a recession, that's failure. So all I say is that we're going to be committed to a policy of full employment, which will mean a, a policy of uh, where the private enterprise system flourishes. That's why I think businessmen are, are wrong, particularly small businessmen. I feel that we're far more helpful to them than the Republicans are. Republican policy favors big business because, uh, because the whole tight, high interest rate policy helps big business, not small business. One other thing, Senator, why are you so reluctant to criticize President Eisenhower? I notice in your speeches you uh, make jibes at other Republicans, rather Republican presidents. You talk about keep cool with Coolidge. Yes, Mr. Harding. Two chickens in a pot with right. Hoover. And you take a crack McKinley. at Landon and Dewey. Right. And then suddenly, when you get to Eisenhower, there's a sort of a silence there. Do you think it uh, would be politically dangerous to uh, criticize President Eisenhower? Then? Well, I feel that President Eisenhower first isn't in the tradition of McKinley, Harding, Coolidge, Landon, Dewey. That's number one. Uh, Mr. You say that he's not in the he's tradition. He's not in that tradition. He came into the Republican Party sort of sideways. In fact, there was some question in 1948 whether he was going to run as a Democrat or not. That's number one. Number two, I have a high regard for President Eisenhower personally. I've been critical of the leadership of this administration. I feel that our power, vigor, prestige has not kept up with the requirements of our times in the last eight years. I've been very critical in every speech I've made of that. President Eisenhower has been the president. He must bear his measure of responsibility. I'm not involved in a personal uh, dispute. I admire the president personally, but I do disagree with the policies that his administration has followed. Basically, however, the question is for the future. That's the question Mr. Nixon and I, we're not un going to undo the last eight years. Mm -hmm. And the question now is, should the country entrust the leadership to the Democratic Party and to me as president, or should they entrust it to the Republican Party and Mr. Nixon? That's the, that's the issue. Mr. Spivak. Senator Kennedy, you and Vice President Nixon seem agreed that the United States is today the strongest military power in the world. Now, since he believes also, as you do, that every necessary step must be taken to keep it so, why do you continue to make an issue of our oh, military well, Mr. strength? Uh, Spivak, we disagree uh, very uh, greatly. He says our prestige has never been higher. Talking about our military power. Oh, no, but this all tied up with the prestige. When I use the word prestige, I'm talking about the image of the United States abroad, militarily, economically, politically, socially, scientifically, educationally. I believe in all those areas, our relative position is not satisfactory. We have sufficient momentum because we had an, an atomic monopoly for a while and a hydrogen monopoly, and we had a great airlift capacity, we, had a great, we have sufficient uh, momentum to carry us through to the present time as a strong military power. But the rate of increase, the rate of military growth, is not in our favor. That's what I disagree with. In fact, we've been living off our fat for the last three or four years militarily. The Soviet Union made the great breakthrough in space and in missiles, and therefore they are going to be ahead of us in those very decisive weapons of war in the early 60s. What is true in militarily is true economically. Their rate of increase is greater. It's certainly true scientifically. And in the image they give to the world of a country on the make, on the move. But, but you agree with him that our military power today is greater than any other power in the world. I would say, uh, I no, well, wait a minute, I've said, said that. that. It's yes, not a question said of agreeing that. with him. I do believe that, that today, October 1960, we are the strongest power in the world. But the point is, the cur the, when are the curves going to meet? The Soviet Union's relative power has been growing steadily in relation to ours, including its military power, especially in the field of missiles. Now, the point I make is, by 1961, 2, and 3 is the crucial time. Are we going to be ahead then? I'm not sure we are, unless we make a greater effort. We're not going to be, in 1962 and 3, the most powerful country in the world. No, but, Senator, the point I'm getting at is that he says, just as you say, that you're going to make every effort to, to stay yes, ahead. Yes, but uh, he, his whole emphasis in his campaign, uh, Ms. Bruthen, and I've read all of his speeches, has been that our power is the highest, our prestige is the highest, we've never had it so good, this administration's influence at the United Nations, and all the rest, that we're at the ascendancy. There is no 
note of urgency in the messages which Mr. Nixon has been giving the last two months. They have been reassuring, and I don't think these are times when we can reassure ourselves that we are stronger, better, that our, that, uh, our power and influence is growing. I think that's the basic issue that separates us. I think that Governor Rockefeller takes the same view I did. His speech in, Ju in June 1960 was as critical of the administration or more critical than anything I have said. I don't think that there's, there's the slightest doubt that the Rockefeller Brothers' reports and his speeches prior to the Republican convention struck the exact same note of urgency that mine did. But Mr. Nixon hasn't struck that note. Mr. Chancellor. Senator Prime Minister McMillan yesterday endorsed the idea of a summit conference to be held next spring. Therefore, we have the Russians demanding one and the British seem leaning toward one. Now, if, uh, if you're the man who would have to attend the summit conference, what would be your views on it? Well, I'm hopeful, uh, in fact, I feel it would be essential, Mr. Chancellor, that there should be negotiation at the secondary level on these matters which uh, uh, divide us. Uh, Berlin, disarmament, cessation of nuclear tests, control of outer space, the disarmament of outer space. I would feel that uh, foreign ministers and at the ambassadorial level there should be conferences which would indicate that we were going to accomplish something. Otherwise, there's a confrontation and then uh, the parties separate. And then what? Unless we're going to meet with an effort to settle at least partially some of these questions or ease the tensions, then the uh, summit uh, serves as nothing more than a uh, gigantic uh, spectacle which uh, disappoints the world. Would that be your view, sir, on the, on the general trend in diplomacy toward what we call personal diplomacy on the part of leaders of states? There's been a great deal of it in the past few years, and some people have criticized it. No, I think that it is, it's valuable. I would think the next president of the United States should certainly talk with General de Gaulle and with Dr. Adenauer, and certainly he would see Mr. McMillan and uh, the others, and I would hope uh, the free world, I think, can stand a good deal of... Uh, communication in the early part of 1961 in order on the question of NATO, which is a very serious one, French position in NATO and all the rest. When we go to meet with the communists, however, and Mr. Khrushchev, who has shown himself to be so volatile, so bellicose, belligerent, I would like to feel that uh, we're moving in a definite direction with some understanding in, in advance. Gentlemen, we have about two and a half minutes. Mr. Abel. <coughs> Senator Kennedy, both parties uh, have been talking civil rights for a great many years. Congress has passed two bills in the past four years, and yet thousands of citizens are still deprived of their voting rights. Would you favor use of the 14th Amendment, Section 2, a uh, tool that, to my knowledge, has not been used in our time, uh, to penalize any state that denies its citizens the right to vote by reducing its congressional rep representation uh, in, in direct proportion? You no, know, I, I think that the best way is to implement... Uh, the Constitution and the laws which Congress passed, which I think give the power, the executive, very clear power. I don't feel that those powers have been used very effectively, either in the 57 or the 60 Act, but in my judgment, the executive has full power to provide the right to vote. I don't think there's any legal limitation now, uh, any lack of weapons by the Attorney General or the President to compel the right to vote if a major effort is made. And in my judgment, a major effort should be made in 1961 to make sure that there's no subterfuge, that everyone has the right to vote, that no tests are used which deprive people artificially based on race of the right to vote. I feel that a, a real effort should be made in this field in 1961. And I think it would have the consent pretty much of the entire country. Senator uh, uh, Fogger. Right. Henry Cabot Lodge made a speech in Harlem and <coughs> promised that a Negro would be appointed to the cabinet if he and Mr. Nixon won. Then he got down to North Carolina and, as I understand it, sort of ate his words. You, you remarked on that yesterday. How would you feel about a Negro in the cabinet if you were successful on November the 8th? Well, I think we ought to pick the best people we can and if the best for each of the tasks. If the best person is a Negro, or if he's white, or if he's Mexican descent, or whether he's... Irish descent or whatever he may be, I believe that he should get the job. But I do believe we should make a, a greater effort to bring Negroes into participation in the higher branches of government. There are no federal district judges. There are 200 odd of them. Not one of them is a Negro. We only have about 26 Negroes in the entire foreign service of 6,000. So that I, particularly now with the importance of Africa and Asia and all the rest, I do believe we should make a greater effort to encourage fuller participation on all levels of all the talent we can get, Negro, white, of any race. Gentlemen, I think at this point I'll have to interrupt. I see that our time is up. Thank you very much, Senator Kennedy, for being with us.